Hi everyone, I'm Salma Qureshi. Welcome to Neuroscientist Talk Shop, the uh, University of Texas at San Antonio's Neuroscience Research Podcast. Today is October 28th, and it's our pleasure to be talking today with Asohan Amar Singham, um, who is Associate Professor of Mathematics at City College and the CUNY Grad Center in New York City. Hi, Asohan. Okay. Um, welcome. Uh, around the table we've got our you know, three mathematically inclined neuroscientists in our group. We've got Francesco Savelli. <laughs> Hi, Francesco. Hi. We've got Charlie Wilson. Hi. Hey, Charlie. And we've got Todd Troyer. Hello. Hey. So, um, I didn't give your lab an introduction, so I'm just going to say that your work concerns <laughs> statistical problems in neural coding and computation very generally, um, including questions related um, to large-scale neurophysiological data. I'm telling you as if you don't already know, but it's for our listeners. Um, and there are implications for understanding um, dynamics and functional properties of neuronal circuits. So, um, so let's, let's just get to it. I, I don't want to stop the momentum here because you guys were already having a great discussion when I, I hit the record button and then stopped everything. So um, I want to start just with this general idea, and you guys run with this. Um, so uh, just by way of introduction, so much of your work has centered on bearing out um, the limitations of conceptual assumptions, right? Like um, about instantaneous firing rate and its relationship to synchrony and variability. Um, and, and these are things that have been used to understand structure and, and spike train data that is sort of at the basis of all the, the neural coding literature. Um, can you talk to us about this problem? Because you've written about this and it kind of frames a lot of the way you, you, you think about attacking um, conceptual things with statistical tools to bear out um, problems in neuroscience? Um, actually, I'm, so the question, so just repeat the, the could you narrow down the question a little bit? <laughs> it was or a like, pose, probably. <laughs> like, well, I basically just, I, I, I want to get to this idea of agnosticism. You talked to us uh, about agnosticism, and, and, and that's a big word, and it means many yeah. things, but you mean it in a very specific way in relation to statistical um, analyses of neuronal spike data that has really relied on conceptual assumptions that are not agnostic, that are sort of built on things like... Yeah, there's, okay, right? there's, yeah, I guess the, pro I guess the way when I said Dara Da, the problem is that there's so many different dimensions of that, um... And so, yeah, I mean, what, what, one thing I was saying when I, when I met with the students is I found that, um, you know, the, the attitude about statistics in, neuro, in like neuroscience, particularly systems neuroscience, which I'm most familiar with, is um, it's, um, it's interesting. I think, you know, it could be described as torture for graduate students a lot of times, you know? And so, you know, one question is why that is. I mean, that kind of, it leads into what you're asking about, I think, a little bit. And what I mean by that is, like, you know, you look at a neuroscience paper and, you know, there might be, like, I don't know, 40 different hypothesis tests or something like that in there. Not very well described. It's just, like, using a parenthetical as if you know what these 40 different tests are. Just an asterisk. <laughs> three. And, you know, and then the reader just glazes over it. I mean, they're looking at something completely, they're looking for something completely different. And then, but then, but there's this performance. That's why it's, like, torture, because it's, like, You've got to put the statistical test in, figure out what it is. And so then you can imagine, you know, the writer, and that's often, you know, it could be, say it's a student, but I didn't mean it that, like, as if there are different classes of neuroscientists. But the writer, say, you know, has to find a test that sounds right. And it's an, that's not really what they're using to think about it, though. You know, they're not really using all the thought that went into statistics to develop these tests, they're just, they have their own ways of thinking about it because they don't understand that, and the mapping between that and neuroscience isn't clear, you know? But we, we, we have this, um, we have this, um, you know, I guess, tradition and culture, and this, you know, of doing these hypotheses tests, and so they have to be in there. But what does it mean? Like, you know, Nature Neuroscience, um, some years ago, um, I somehow I was the recipient of an email from them about we want to have these checklists now for statistical um, for the reviewers. I don't know what happened to that. I think maybe it's, it's there, there, right? Yeah, it's there. And they were like, "Do you have any advice about?" Um, I was just part of a group. It wasn't like particularly for me about how to formulate that. And I was thinking, you know, often when I read a paper, because okay, then I was trained as ma in math and and I was supposed to try to be learned statistics. And I was trying to apply it to neuroscience. So I was reading these neuroscience papers from the perspective as most students is where you just read the paper 
And then these things that we were talking about of the difference between what someone thinks and what the paper says hadn't dawned on me yet. And so I thought that the goal was, okay, we look up these tests and figure out why they did this test. And I, what I really found after years of that was like, what I want the reader, to, the writer to tell me is, you know, this is the crucial piece of this experiment from the narrative I'm telling. And then, and then the, that should be like three or four really carefully chosen statistical analyses. And I'm going to tell you why they're important. I'm going to tell you what the assumptions are. And I'm going to tell you why those assumptions are relevant to the problem. And then I'd be able to read it and then think about it for myself. But that's not how it works. And I think the way it works is more, it's like we've given up because we know that if we thought about it hard, we wouldn't really find it realistic or something, you know, if we go back into the assumptions. So then we kind of hide behind these, okay, this is possibly a tertiary. We might be hiding behind hundreds of tests or whatever it is, not hundreds, but, um, and we're, because we don't want to really focus on the key one and then the problems it raises. Because I think the problems it raises are, you know, what is the right assumptions to make about neural data for the theories we want to test about the brain? Um, and then that leads to the question of agnosticism. I think if you think about it, it seems like we want to be really agnostic um, in terms of this question of what assumptions do we make about neural data in order to answer questions about the brain? Because the, this is one of the most highly designed systems in nature, it seems like. I mean, it's almost like an alien civilization has given us one of their technologies, and we're trying to figure out what it is, and then we treat things as independent and lots of noise, and that's how statistics was built. It was like, let's flip a coin again and again and again, and um, it doesn't seem like it maps well, you know, to... Um, yeah this incredibly designed system that's producing thought and, you know, seems to be spiking. That's like all we know about it. Yeah, I don't know. That's, so, that, so then when you try to do it seriously where you're like, okay, let's imagine I was trying to defend my assumptions and doing statistics, then I, I ended up working on narrower questions that I could get my hands around but that seemed relevant to neuroscience. But then, they, they, you know, the agnosticism there was minimal assumptions, um... And, you know, how do you make sense of that? And, you know, that's a lot about what the talk was about. But if you get I mean, a paper yeah. like that, if you do, if you actually do that, if you actually take statistics seriously, then you have to, like, argue and convince your reviewers and stuff about statistics. And a lot of them either don't know or they don't want to, they don't do that, right, unless it's important. So, I mean, so they'd rather not have it be important and just have something that they're familiar with. Yeah. Uh, and and go on and say, yeah, yeah, okay, I'm, I'm convinced and see your graph and that makes sense and let you sound some things and check things off. Well, okay, so this is interesting to think about. Yeah. So you guys agree with kind of the story I sketched? Was that, would, they, would that be like... Well, yeah, I, do, I, I would say there's a, a little more to it. I mean, you, you started off by saying that our students consider statistics... No, no, I was at your students. And I uh, <laughs> teach statistics. Oh, okay, all right. I'm all right. teaching it right now to the students yeah. who are in that room, so... That threw me a little bit off right from the very beginning, but... Oh, did I say that? Did I say that in the talk? The teaching evaluations are like... <laughs> so, so, so I think the students probably have a hard time giving teaching evaluations that are not categorical because one of the things about biology is that it is categorical. It is not quantitative. So people like to just put things into categories, as you know, just by looking at taxonomy, instead of instead of trying to assign a value to stuff. So one of the problems that biologists have with statistics is that it's sort of a lot of it is continuous and parametric, and it, and it needs to be more categorical for them to think. And a lot of times you'll hear people say, I just don't, I don't see why we need statistics. There were only two outcomes, and it came out this way and not that way. Right. It's not like I had in the Okay, that, that's what I mean is that, so you look for, I think, I think you, so one, one implication is like, if, if, you're, if your finding is subtle and relies on an incredibly careful partitioning and, and precision about the data, then these, um, these um, 
these assumptions could contaminate that, and you'd better be thinking about them carefully. Another thing to do is, let, let me just come up with a better experiment where it's clearer to me yes. without all of that, and that's going to get more trust. That's going to have more play anyway because Most people the, the readers are going to trust it, and so that's kind of um, that's kind of a way of saying it. But then you still have to do the performance act we still of, end up, of uh, doing the statistics. Actually, we still uh, end up with the kind of data that we end up with, which isn't necessarily the kind that we want. So right. our experiments don't come out clearly categorically. Right. Right. And so we. We're trying to force them into some yeah. categories in which they don't really necessarily belong. And we look for tools in this statistical armamentarium that allows us to force our data into whatever boxes we want it to be in. I mean, I, I guess I'm painting a kind of a negative picture, but that is the thing that you're noticing in the literature, maybe, and that was... Well, I, just started, I definitely noticed when I went to a lab and I just saw how people were going from experimental research to publish papers. Yeah. And that, pro that's, I mean, torture is a... Yeah, the statistics... I wouldn't write that down. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, you shared it well, the But it's like, it was like, you know, it was just like a labor that I don't think anyone thought yeah. was valuable. Yeah. Um, was a common reaction. Yeah. Um, I mean, there was some hunger for... Because the problem is, once you're dealing with very high-dimensional data, then it becomes completely yes. unavoidable. Right. Um, and now everybody finds themselves doing that, and yeah, and so there's a lot more interest in statistics now than there used to be among neuroscientists, I think. Well, one point. So, um, how come is that the more we use statistics, and you know the amount of statistics and sophistication that we've been using, the more we go into the crisis of irreproducibility. And because statistics not being used the way it's supposed to be used. And I do remember um, what uh, I think Buzaghi wrote in the obituary for um, Case Van der Wolf. And he said that his papers had very little statistics because he would rather spend the time to repeat the experiments until he was convinced. Yeah. And if you read old literature, you know, there's less statistics. But there are results yeah. that have been stood the test of time much more than you know more recent literature, literature that yeah. we find. So there's obviously a problem there. Right. Now personally I was always um, so one thing to appreciate is that what we use in experimental biology is what is called frequentist statistics. And it uh -huh. is irreconcilable, at least from to some people. Including me, you mean just it is from normally irreconcilable with Bayesian statistic, Bayes, right? Statistics, which is what we should be using, in my opinion, and in other people's opinion. But if you look at the field of statistics, there is this fight between yeah. frequent statistics and Bayesian statistics, which is philosophically irreconcilable. Some people will tell you they are philosophically irreconcilable. I do not believe so, but you know, I'm also not a statistician, so you know, like take everything yeah. I say with a grain of salt. But, um, so there is this problem that, you know, if you think about frequent statistics, so all the hypothesis testing, so once you start going hypothesis testing, of course everything becomes a category, which is like yes or no, yes or no, yes or no. Everything becomes binary, and then it gets combined like in a sort of Boolean way, which actually denies ever all the assumptions of frequent statistics. And then, um, Frequent statistics is much younger, like, you know, it's probably, what, 80 years old or something like that? And people think that that's a scientific method. And it's just terrible. Okay, so that, that's an interesting comment. Would you like to? Yeah, 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 I, 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 yeah. I, could, I, I could thought about this issue. I mean, so one <laughs> thing you're pointing to, here. one thing, <laughs> maybe, uh, one thing you're pointing to is um, uh, statistics is messy, if, meaning, like, even if you go to the field for recommendations, you don't get a coherent response, right? Yeah. So I remember there was a um, there was an article in Nature. This is you know the, this was all highlighted in um, in this this reproducibility explosion or that's the word for it um, crisis crisis yeah. Yeah, it was, it was used um, and you know there's a lot to say about that and we probably don't want to turn this into a discussion of that because that's the whole thing but um, you know I, I remember that there was like so Nature consult you know uh, um, asked a bunch of statisticians to give some advice and 
And then when I, when I noted, when I saw that, I was like, there's, there's lots of different advice yeah. <laughs> how to deal with this problem. So that's one issue. Uh, on the particular, the base versus frequentist thing, I think, I think that really, so look, what I presented today was all frequentist, right? Um, I would say something about, um, it's not so binary because there's this question of p-values, which is not really binary. You have to think through it a little bit, what that comes to. But what does the p-value say? Because most people think it's the probability that, you know, the, the null hypothesis, but... It's not really... It's not. Okay, it's so, not. Yeah, it's the, not. the problem it's is actually, the p-value the is hard to understand, but yeah. it comes from a place. So, like, it's not true that they're... I, I wouldn't say it's not true that they're um, irreconcilable, but actually I think the frequentist is more agnostic. I, I don't think that the reason my stuff was frequentist... No, I don't think is, is separate. No, no, it is. It was. I was just having frequent to stuff. It, the the reason um, the reason it's frequent is the reason I was seeking not some not unrelated. So like, um, so well, in fact, the original Bayesian, like the, if you go back to the first, uh, no, the original frequentist, you go back to like Neiman. If you look in that paper, what he was trying to do. Uh, this is the one where you get the name wrong and you're embarrassed later. <laughs> this is the example. Let's <laughs> say Neiman. It's one of these guys, though. And, um, you know, what he was trying to do is he wanted conclusions that would be valid for all possible priors. So he was thinking about the Bayesian problem, but he didn't want to be, um, he didn't want to choose a prior. He wanted a conclusion like, if you, my reader, have a different prior than me, I want you to agree with me. That's agnosticism, right? Because the, pro the, the you know, the Bayesian is very compelling from um, it compelling from a um, decision making point of view, right? It's like you cannot be co a coherent decision maker and not be a Bayesian, right? All that stuff, extremely compelling. Um, but you know, what if you? That's that's just that's one person's consistency. How do you get intersubjective consistency? So you have two different people. So if a drug company gives me its conclusions with its priors, that, that doesn't tell me anything. So then, then, you, then it seems like what you need is something that's independent of the prior. That's where the frequentist thing came from. That's the first Neiman frequentist. So that, so that ends up, so there's a great paper that I think everyone is, should read about this, which is from Bradley Efron, who's one of the giants in statistics. Um, in the event of the bootstrap, I mean the number of contributions, National Mental Science was one of the leaders in statistics which is called Why Isn't Everyone Evasion? And it's a short opinion piece. It's a classic in statistics. It's like 86. And he's just making some observations. One observation is, look, the, the, since Savage, the Bayesian view has been, um, is dominated theoretical thinking, meaning like there's every, as if you read these papers, you're like, there's no thing else to do besides Bayesian. Like we're all idiots for not being, thinking like Laplace. Basically. As you said, that's the original way of thinking, right? So like, um, and he said, well, but then if you look at the literature, like biology, like everyone's using frequentist. It's easy. Why are they doing it's it? It's easier. No, but he it's gives... a book or recipe, and yeah. it's easier, and you can just... But he it. gives these other reasons, like the ones I just mentioned. Like, he's saying, no, not everyone's an idiot. He didn't come to that conclusion, Efron. He's like, he thinks there's a, he's saying, I think there's a reason that they keep doing it. And but, but anyway, one obvious one that you wouldn't have a quick answer to is, what if you disagreed about the prior? But the prior in Bayesian, so the prior becomes less and less important as more data comes in. Oh, okay, so that, so, so for example, just, just, so okay, just get more data. Yeah. Do what Van der Waals was doing. Okay. Do more experiments. No, that's so the classic, like, that's, the, like, that's the classic answer, but there's, so that, that's the bad part of the Bayesian story, right? Like, oh, the prior doesn't matter because it's, it's swamped by the, the likelihood. But, you know, so for example, in the stuff I talked about, that wouldn't have happened. In that inconsistency stuff, where things are really non-stationary, I, it, the, if it, unless the prior is right, it's not going to be consistent. But that's because they're not stationary. The system's changing. So even that, like, that's like IID data. Like, you know, that, that debate that the prior doesn't matter if you have enough data. If the likelihood is not consistent. So the, the example I gave at the end, it was like, I was taking this high dimensional system, and then I showed the maximum likelihood estimator is not consistent. So if the likelihood estimator is consistent, the prior is not going to save you unless the prior is right. So the posterior is not going to be consistent either. Because remember the... Like the poster is the product of the likelihood of the product. Anyway, I'm just kind of quoting the kind of arguments that Efron makes in this article. Yeah, right. 
Can, can, I, uh, can I ask can, a, a question, a neuroscience uh, related question? Yeah. <laughs> I did not please you guys. <laughs> but you know, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah, like, you know what I'm talking about, right? Just, we could start yeah. arguing but whether it's better to use VI or to use Emacs. Yeah. No, but, that, right? so, get, but this no, is related no, to no, this, this, this is related to statistics. Yeah. Yeah. This is just really. <laughs> As much as I don't know that it's, okay, it's, I'll, it's I'll, very I'll, important. Yeah. Well, this is related to statistics is messy because you can yeah. there's different because schools of thought in statistics. statistics yeah. You have to make all sorts of assumptions. Yeah. I mean, there's no way of creating an unbiased. So here's a good here's a good statistics. so here's a good example. You well, maybe it's not good for this podcast. What is the underlying distribution yeah. and anything falls if that's not the underlying distribution? The point is me, where are you putting your uncertainty right. on your hypothesis or not your data? And that's where. But let, okay, let me let me give you an interesting example. It's a toy example. But anyways, it wasn't a criticism about you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, about, like, you know, they... no because I think it's related to my question about agnosticism. Is that okay. the kind of priors we want for the brain is like this priors for an appropriate alien technology. It's like saying like, what's the prior on whether you know, you know, a certain alien civilization has this feature? It's just like, we don't know anything about alien civilizations. Like, how do we come up with a prior for that? And the, so I think I think agnosticism. That's what he's saying with the frequentist. Okay, here's an example. Like the non-parametric um, permutation test, two-sample distribution. Um, that's valid for any probability distributions. If the if okay, so the, the the setup is, it's this shuffling stuff that you've seen, right? But let's. The simplest example is like, you have two distributions. So you have data generated from two distributions, x and y. Let's call the distributions x and y. And then you have multiple independent samples from X and multiple independent samples from Y. It is possible to create a hypothesis test that tests the hypothesis whether those samples are the same without making any assumptions other than the independence about the form of the distribution. So that's an example. That's, that, and that's an example of like, like, if you do that with a Bayesian, then you're going to put a prior on the, the joint distribution on the uh, distributions, you know, and but this, you know, I've, I've, this is part of like statistics is messy. There's no I use perfect that answer for my paper, and I always try to do it in the most meaningful way. Yeah. And you know, of course, all that uh, non-parametric is good and everything, but you always have this idea. Okay, this, I am I am creating a control distribution. Yeah, I'm making it up. It might or might not be relevant to what the to the real control distribution could be for the brain because I don't know how the brain is set up. And yeah. so, like, what does shuffling and stuff? I do it all the time. It's the best you can do. But I mean, it has its own. There's it, it depends yeah. on whether it's meaningful for the brain. But it, like I'm saying, for that one, it's the question of whether these are. You know, it's because it's if it's the appropriate question. I mean, I think the standard of hypothesis testing is more like test a well-defined hypothesis test, and maybe that's rare that there's yeah. a well-defined. That the bigger problem is that our scientific question actually corresponds to a well-defined hypothesis. You know. Um, Anyway, but anyway, my point was like, is, yeah. you know, we could do much better in science if we just kind of rely a little more, put a little more importance about replicating studies in another lab rather than, you know, well, replication. All, yeah. this, all these all right. tests. And I there is a lot to say about replication. Yes. Yeah. But in some ways, that if you, if you, I think if you step back to like what people actually do with the sociology of things, yeah. uh, this thing about Bayesian things, oh, well, you don't know what the priors are, and then you just gather more data. Well, people should gather more data if they can for a lot of the frequentist stuff. When you see P less than 0. 0.0001 or whatever, it's like, I don't care if it's like exactly the right test. It's obvious, right? And so yeah. Yeah. It, you get as many things that you can if the, if the experiment is set up right and the, fi- the results are obvious, then you don't have to, yeah. you have to make this argument, right? Yeah. And, and if, it's, if it's P like... Yeah, you know, 0.04, then you're like, I don't know. I, yeah, you can be convinced of data without, you know, regardless of distance. And it's and it's, some of it's the same, also, it's kind of the flip side of the same argument about, oh, yeah, let's be, let's check, actually check the hypothesis of the, uh, of the assumptions of the hypothesis test. Or, if you you know, if you get a Bayesian thing, well, you actually have to specify your priors, which is also really hard, you know, yeah. argue about those. And both of them are really checking so that your statistical framework is really kind of matching your, your experiment. Um, and that's really hard in either kind of way. And so, yeah, you, you'd like it to be easy. So the question is, what do you do, like, what do you expect when, how, how much do you trust statistics overall, like in papers and stuff like that? Uh, and what's the joint 
yeah. acceptable uh, kind of use and care. Because it's a lot of it's being careful and being even honest about. You could say there's a trend or a statistic. You know, this is significant, but you yeah. clear what you're actually testing, and there may be, you know, there may be issues with that test or something. And then if the problem, one of the problems I think is that if statistics get used to be maybe by students or other people, it's like, well, that tells us where to stop the experiment, right? Like, I need to get enough this enough data, like. Even with that experiment, maybe not you're analyzing that data, but you know you're happy it came out. Like I did, I had ten cells, and you know it's significant. It's close. I'll do two more. <laughs> Even if you don't do that, That's you still are happy that it is, <laughs> right? And you, you have mm -hmm. your set up your test, yeah, mm -hmm. and then you're happy that it's that it's significant, and you're good with that. And. Mm -hmm. Rather than, I don't know, that data looks kind of funky. Yeah, it's significant, but I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not like I'm offering an alternative. I mean, yeah. but it's just an observation that it's a head, for, for a lot of the literature, it does seem like it's a headache rather than, uh, you know, fulfilling this, the role that in, the, in a vacuum it might have designed, been designed to fulfill. Uh, but for people in um, neuroscience, it seems to me that um, they've decided that as a prior, that the neuron is a little statistical black box that has some probability of firing in any time delta t, and right. that that probability is modified by some rate function, which is the product of who knows what. Right. And, uh, and so we start with this assumption that the neuron is the statistical black box. And so I was wondering, I was asking Todd earlier today, where did this idea come from? I mean, what, who, who first said that that's how neurons work? Because that's, of course, that's not what most. Yeah, the reason, one reason I put those, I put those quotes up to that uh -huh. effect, it just helps to facilitate the discussion. You know, it's like, well, like, like rather than arguing whether anyone thinks that, well, somebody's written that uh -huh. at least, and then we could go from there. But I know, I meant to say, I don't know if I said it, that I don't. It's not. That's related to this question of not knowing what people really think because. Uh -huh. What neurons you need to make. You need to publish a paper. You need to make progress, and you know, you get, you can't just sit around and endlessly debate these foundational issues. You know, mm. there definitely you, are. People <laughs> you said the right thing and right go down. There definitely are people who think that neurons are deterministic yeah. machines. But that's what that's what I was saying. Is like I, sometimes I, I I learned that oh I didn't think so. I often, like I said, I don't think I'm making very profound observations that I wouldn't want to defend this is some insight that no one else has. It's just, you know, there's also the performance and like, it's reasonable. You got, you got to go on the business of the science or whatever, however complicated that is. Um, but sometimes I get confused because I just assume, okay, they write about the noise in a certain way. I mean, this is probably what you guys are referring to with the, the conversations with Jim Bauer. That, and then, um, you know, I, I know they don't really think that, but this is a way to continue, and let's assume that's the case. Conditionally on that, let me do some research and not worry, like solve that problem every time I have to do anything. Uh, but they don't really believe it. And then I, I see in other papers or in other settings, some com some straight comment, like you think, oh, they, no, they really believe it, that, um, that there's some irreducible noise, or the thing is noisy, and that's the big problem we have to solve, or that there, there are multiple neurons all signaling the same thing and someone else is averaging them, you know, these kinds of ideas. Uh -huh. And so, yeah, I'm, I'm often confused about what the, you know, the difference between the performance and the true beliefs are, too, I mean, yeah. in terms of these questions. I mean, one thing that's interesting is the um, axonal failure for noise, right? Um, you mean synaptic release? Synaptic release probability, for example. Yeah, so there are these... You know, there's a, you could ask yourself, if you're a neurophysiologist, you might ask yourself, if neurons are noisy, where does the noise come from? What would be the and what do you mean physical by that? origin of noise? Like, you know, um, uh, radioactive decay is, is probabilistic, it's fundamentally probabilistic, it's well, what does that mean? In nature, right? <laughs> but okay, yeah. But, but if, I, if, I, if, I, if I understand something about radioactive decay, I could say, I couldn't possibly know anything about when this decay is going to happen. So I can yeah. say it really is a Poisson From process. the point of view of? Physics. 
No, or not the observer. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, it's just crazy yeah. life. <laughs> but if, uh, if I'm looking at a neuron, I could ask, yeah. where would that come from? What kind of physics in a neuron could possibly give rise to, um, to, to noise, to something that's random? So, for example, if I want my computer to make something that's random, I have to go to a lot of trouble because computers are not fundamentally noisy. There's no noise source in a computer built into it. So I have to come up with some kind of crazy algorithm. It doesn't work as well as it ought to, and there's controversy about whether it's really random or not. So is the brain a thing like a computer that's going to have to create noise for itself if it wants noise? Or is it a thing like radioactive decay that just automatically has noise whether you want it to or not? And, and so, people have tried to answer those kinds of questions. And one of the things that seems genuinely stochastic about neurons is the stochastic nature of synaptic transmission and, and random failures in synaptic transmission. It's not really non-deterministic. It's noise in the Poincaré sense with the intersection of multiple independent lines of causation that are all deterministic. But in the end, it looks completely random to us. So it's a little bit like a sort of... Well, what, I think what we mean by noise there is we imagine there's something being computed. And that's the problem, is you've got to imagine that. And then you say, well, this has nothing to do with that or something, right? I mean, no, no, no. You're just saying an action potential arrived. Yeah. And was there synaptic release of, of transmission? Yeah, but that could be the computation that it's not Yeah, but you don't, have to, you don't have to have any idea about what synaptic transmission means. Well, it's kind of hard to say. Why, why say maybe it could be that the fact it wasn't released was, is, is a part of the computation. Possibly, but if you're studying synaptic transmission, you're not thinking about any computation. You're just thinking action potential, release. And then there right. might be biochemical steps. But why call it noise, then, if it doesn't they release? They don't. Oh. They don't. They call it stochasticity, <laughs> right? They say that the release <laughs> is, is unpredictable. And so why would it be well, that's, unpredictable? Why would it uh, be unpredictable? Maybe yeah. it's that it is predictable, but we just can't predict it because we don't know enough. Yeah. Or maybe it's really unpredictable because it arises from something that's fundamentally unpredictable. Yeah. Or maybe it's unpredictable because there are numerous completely predictable things that are all independent of each other that intersect to make that decision. And so, that so it's got such high dimensionality of it, this deterministic thing with super high dimensionality, and it yeah. just looks like noise to us. What, no, no, okay, so okay, I wasn't distinguishing noise and randomness. So, so when, you, when you use the word noise, you mean? Well, then I do think I know what the signal is. To me, oh. signal is the thing that's interfering with, the noise is the thing that's interfering with my detection of a signal. So I wouldn't use it in a non-communication... Oh, so you only use the word noise when you know what the computation is? Yeah, okay. because I got that yeah, yeah. from Shannon, who knew exactly what noise was. I mean, that's, to me, noise is something that Shannon taught me. Uh -huh. I mean, I didn't learn it from Shannon. I read. <laughs> 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 but... Um, uh, but r random is, doesn't imply anything about a signal. Something is random just because I can't predict yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? But I, I think so, some people use those words interchangeably. I know. There's yeah, all yeah. kinds of, it's one of the yeah, yeah, yeah. crazy word things. So there's one possible place where you could get neurons doing something that didn't seem deterministic at all. The neuron fires. There's no release. The next time the neuron fires, there is some release. Yeah. So if you're looking for a source of unpredictability in neuronal interactions, you could, you could jump on that. You could say, oh boy, I found it. It's yeah. there. And in fact, if, you're, if you think that unpredictability in the nervous system is the source of consciousness, then you could jump on that and say, consciousness comes because of synaptic transmission failure. And there are people who have said that. There's whole books written about that idea. And so, uh, uh, which I do not, I have read those, <laughs> at least so occasionally read books, but, that, but I don't necessarily adhere to some kind of idea about consciousness. I mean, if, if you have a, a, a well-defined computation in which uh, it's important to use random num truly random numbers, say, or like you could yeah. say, maybe that could, would be an appropriate word for that, be like injecting noise, the use of a random number generator? 
Yeah, okay. I, I mean, I would. And that's part of yeah, the computation. Yeah, well defined. That you would call that noise. Yeah, if there's a okay. signal that's being interfered with. But, the, but the, the, it's weird to call it a signal because the random number, it's important to have the random number okay. do the computation. Yeah, so I, I really don't. I like, use, here's I an example. Like, if you're asking me would I use the, use, would use the word noise there, I would say no, I wouldn't. I just, you would use the word noise, yeah, okay. I wouldn't use noise, but I don't mind. if somebody But yeah, it's not like, for example, like, like, okay, a simple example would be a randomized control trial. Like, uh -huh. wh why do we randomly choose the one population to, to yeah. assign it to it? What is noise? the role of the randomness there? Yeah, would you call that noise? I wouldn't really. Uh, I, I guess I wouldn't. Have, I, it wouldn't surprise me if someone called that noise. Uh, I wouldn't take it for granted that it, that it wasn't the meaning of the word noise if someone used uh -huh. it. Like, because uh -huh. I would just be confused too often, I think. Uh -huh. Well, so for me, <laughs> anyway, I'm thinking about neurons as communication lines. And so I can't stop. I but there's to, comp computation, though, uh, not just communication. Well, so shouted is, yeah, that's the thing, is it's communication, not computation. No difference. <laughs> there's some relationship between the two of them, but. It's preserving, like, uh, communicating a state of the world, you know, and that pre therefore preserving the information well, if you just, about that state. If you just take three communication lines and do. Uh, some of them you've just done a computation, but you really don't have anything but three communication lines. Yeah, that's a computation. Yeah. yeah, exactly. So that's fine. But that's not so to me. Yeah. If if I'm studying, I don't know. Yeah. You, you could commute, select, be selective in what you're communicating. Yes. Yeah, that's and, computation. That's yeah, the that other way to say computation. Yeah. yeah but so then, I don't have it. then it becomes not that different than communicating. The problem. You communicate yeah. some things than others. The things. problem is the computation at the. But the point the is, you're throwing away information. That's another form. Of, that's a, could be argued that's that's another way to call it noise. At the biological right? level, you can yeah. understand the cause of something being random, but there is no biological. Yeah. Equivalent. I think of, that's a big independence. Computation. There isn't something I could look at. This is a big problem for neuroscientists. I'd like to stick my electrode in the brain and measure the computation, but I can't do that because the computation isn't a thing that you can measure in the brain. So it is off limits for like biological measurement. You must have to infer it from something, from something that wasn't, that you measured that wasn't a computation. So I measured some release of transmitter, I measured some synaptic potential, I measured some action potential. I think that somewhere in there there was a computation, but it wasn't the release of transmitter, and it wasn't the synaptic potential, and it wasn't the action potential. Uh, but it was, but it was probably in there somewhere. So that's one of the reasons why it's pretty easy for biologists to study action potential generation, propagation, release of transmitters, synaptic transmission, action potential generation at the next end. Yet we can know a lot about that, but still not know very much about computation. So it's good to have an example because we're this is we're in a big abstract. That's the problem with um, studying the brain is that if yeah we don't know what it is we're already at like the level of abstraction that everyone disagrees with, right? Except we have some. I mean, if we're looking for something that we do agree on, we could talk about how action potentials get generated, right. how they get propagated, how synaptic transmitters get released, that kind of stuff. Right, so right, we could right. start. I guess we could we could start with. Fairly safely with that stuff right. and develop that. But I, I think it's not clear what you, it's not clear what noise is in, the, in those settings. It's not clear what you can talk about noise unless you have a signal, right? You can definitely that, talk about randomness or you can talk about randomness, but that's what you're distinguishing yeah. those, right? Yeah. I'm using your sense of the word yeah. noise. Yeah, until um, you have until you know yeah. what the signal is, it's really hard yeah. to know it. So, if that's for example, really noise, in some yeah. of your stuff, you're you're saying. Let's assume, in fact, we can construct some spike trains in which the signal is some small amount of synchronous activity. And then we could ask, can we separate that signal from the noise? Is that a Well, another way to look at it is more like, if I want to separate the contributions of different kinds of timescales, then one way to do it is, um, you know, I guess, can you think about it as noise? It wouldn't matter if the slower time scale. It's almost being how do you be agnostic about the slower time scale? One version of that is that if it's just noise, right? Um, here, okay, here's the th interesting thought experiment that somewhat relates to what I talk about, and um, 
it gives a concrete example. So like, so in the randomized control trial, it's just just to rem- just to remind ourselves like, the reason that it's random, is that we're imagining our en- like our like God is like a diabolical enemy, right? <laughs> like, so the, and we believe that what we mean by random is nothing in nature could predict what I, what I my selection my random control mechanism, that just gives me peace of mind that they're not connect, there's not some confound that's hidden. That's the only reason it's been random, right? We could just choose, split it into two parts, um, in, you know, maybe by, in, the, in some population, look, look at the people A to M and N to Z. And if we really believe the letter has nothing to do with what we're studying, that's the same as random. Yes. So what we mean is independent, mm-hmm. just unpredictable by our theory of nature, right? Yeah. So, I mean, so I mean, so here's an example of that. So related to that, so that that the whole the binding by synchrony story I was telling, we were talking about. This. So the 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 the, the so this is the Stu Gibbon theory I kind of hinted at quickly and a little, with a little more depth to Todd earlier, which is so here's the thing he was interested in. So binding by synchrony it, it, it is a for neuroscientists it it I think it's not um, it, it's a controversial concept. I mean, um, and it's normally associated with, I guess, Singer or maybe Van der Maal, certain names um, in which the idea is that you have perceptual parts um, and those perceptions are maybe um, based on neural activity or population activity, and that's often thought of as some variances like features, and they somehow have to be put together, and that's called binding, how they're put together. There's a lot... There's controversy even in that, but then the, so there's the idea that that's done by synchrony, and then there might be some experiments about that, like observing synchrony, and then these questions come up about what do you mean by synchrony? Chance comes up and all that. That's what we were talking about today. I was talking about today. So anyway, so so th- so th- th- with that background, it actually, I, I we were motivated by a particular idea of Stu's, which is different a little bit than all that in that it was more mechanistic. Like, his idea, actually, he gave the mechanism for where the synchrony was going to come from, why he was interested in it. And this role of randomness ends up playing a role, I think, in that. It's kind of like the role of the randomness in the randomized control trial. Like, you can see why, what you mean by randomness and why you want it. Um, so his idea is the following. Like, so he, um, he this is someone who's thought a lot about um, computer vision and so the more the pure... Um, like the non-biological version of intelligence, like just putting the biology aside and, um, you know, built a lot of vision machines. And, and in fact, this was before the deep nets, the current state of the art, you know. Um, and somebody thought a lot about complicated prob- probability models for these things. And, um, and he said he felt he had this intuition. Um, and, you know, I, I might be um, translating it wrong, so don't blame him, but... So, but, but my impression was he had the understanding that, um, you know, segmentation is a really fundamental problem. It, it was, like, famously so in computer vision that, um, you know, they said, we'll do this this summer, and, you know, it's 60 years later, and, you know, what goes with what um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a visual scene, and, you know, for any sensory modality, that's a problem. Um, and so he felt like the thing that, happened was that you have some invariances so you you do he does you do take seriously that you're detecting something and that's that what that means is that you react invariantly to something meaning like i said mom that's an invariance to something i thought about my mom you know the speech act is the invariance there so so imagine you have these things and they think he felt like you often do build such things when you're building like a a, le- a character recognition device for some company um, and then, but then the problem is like, you know, the background thing you also gets lit up by the, your feature detectors, no matter how well you do the feature detector, whether it's a line detector or face detector or whatever. And, um, and then you end up with, you can't just kind of treat all the feature detectors independently and then make some decision about what the scene is or something like that. So you got to figure out which ones go with which thing. So like which line... Which, which curve here goes with this curve here to make the face and 
Um, and so that so that was the buy that's that's but that's kind of the binding issue if you think about it that way. And he felt like the problem was always that you know that you're going to get all these false alarms, um, and you've lost the sense of the relationships by building the feature detectors. And then he had this strong kind of conjecture, um, as a which ended up being like a principle of grouping, which was. So then you have, you have to have not just kind of plausibility in detecting a feature, but you have to have a way of symbolizing or representing relationships among feature detectors, like relationships between objects or relationships between parts of a sentence to form the sentence, etc. cetera. And um, the strong conjecture was the degree to which things ought to be bound together in the sense of forming some kind of relationship was the degree to which whatever activated them was the same thing. So, for example, you know, you're building a line detector and it's built out of pixels, or maybe, you know, um, yeah, say, let's stick to computer vision. Um, and then, so, but and what you mean by line detector is maybe translation invariance in some receptive field or something like that. And But that itself is coming up from other, like, um, like maybe thalamic cells that have receptive fields that are, you know, on surround off on off you know, on center off surround or something like that. Like basically like pixels, and then the line detector is saying, um, "This is firing, or this is firing, or this is firing, this is firing." That's a line, or it's somewhere else. This is firing, and this is firing, this is firing. Um, and then somehow you have two different line detectors, and in fact they're drawing from a common pool at the retina or the thalamus or whatever. And, and so he wanted to know whether he wanted to bring those, to bind those together, uh, whether um, they were, um, it was the same stuff. So for example, you have two different lines. Is it literally the same pixels that they share that's activating them? So that there would be, so if you have two different line detectors, you know, when they share the same stuff, they're like, basically overlapping versus this they're not overlapping and so so when he was thinking about the biologically he conjectured that you'd want to know to in order to determine whether things were activated by the same stuff you could look at whether if they were being coded by spikes whether their spikes were synchronous because the degree to which their spikes are synchronous would reflect that they had a common input even if it could be many layers away, right? So why would that be the case? Um, or okay, so that that's a kind of a coding scheme. In fact, in fact, you know, when I was that's what I was saying a little bit in my talk. Like in, in the causal inference literature, that is a principle, like this Reichenbach's principle of common cause, which is that if things are correlated, there's a common cause, or they cause each other. And it's argued about, but it's still kind of there as like a a a gestalt, almost. This is kind of the same thing. But the, what's happening is that as you pass through the spikes, you've lost the information about who caused this neuron to spike. But in this case, if the timing is random, it's like the randomized control trial. Because it's random, it's just independent. Then the only way they have the same timing is that they they had a common author. But it was important that that author be random, kind of, in the sense of the randomized control trial. Because if they were, if it was a, it was just kind of, if it was, um, say it was, it was firing like a periodic oscillator, there wouldn't be much room to like distinguish authors. You know what I mean? Like the the fact that they it's random, which is independent to what you're trying to do, makes the coincidence much stronger when there is a coincidence. Mm -hmm. um, so that would be an example of like, okay, that's a system in which you're. You're using randomness somehow. By randomness now, it's like it's really independence, unpredictability, um, for some purpose, kind of like in the randomized control trial. In fact, in, in, in a lot of machine learning and mathematics, randomness is systematically used. And even in proofs, right? In the channel, the, the channel coding theorem, it's like things are easier just by assuming it's random. Yeah. Um, so... I didn't mean to argue that randomness didn't exist. I, in fact, we were talking about about where it comes from. We were just yeah, no, no, but this is the randomness of just independence. Uh -huh. It's just like, 
Like I want to I want to flip a coin to check choose which subjects would get the treatment, because I I know that there's in my view theory of the world, there's no way you can go from the coin flipping to knowing the what's gonna the drug is gonna do, yeah. right? Um, so it's just a statement of ignorance. Like it's like you know independence judgments are easier to make than probability judgments. Like if I ask you, what's the probability a certain word is said in some street in Japan the next minute? You wouldn't know, but if I ask you whether it's affected, connected to this one, you'd be like, yeah, it's nothing to do with this bus. Um. It's interesting, um, you know, a lot of what we're discussing, I know probably with Charlie, I don't know if he's going to like what I'm saying, but who? a lot of what we're discussing actually, can, it goes back to, in a way, that kind of philosophical difference between Bayesian and Frequentist, because... Who's not going to like it? People would know me uh, for uh, you're all, not like it. This is, uh, <laughs> I think this is where I came in. Well, I think we're oscillating. <laughs> the, the fact is, like, you know, where randomness is. That's actually yeah, the yeah. question. Is like, you know, for frequentists, but you're assuming the reality is, is created by random number generators that are biased. That's but you still think that, that even after that... A Bayesian believes that uncertainty comes from the limits of the human action observation and understanding. But then you didn't agree with what I said then. Well, you know, it's, the question is, is it it's what Charlie no, is saying, is it, is it a neuron deterministic or not? Where does this randomness come from? Is it like you measure, you know, people use noise, but it's noise, is it your measurement error? Is it like something that you could have deterministic systems that are chaotic and so they look like random, but they're not really random? Is it, what is this randomness? But I'm just pointing out that, you know, if you go it's back like, to the Neiman paper, where the frequency thing was first developed, what he was trying, he was working within the Bayesian point of view, but he was just trying to, what conclusions can I make without, uh, that it, that'll, be, that'll be the same regardless no, of my choice of prior. Lots of people have investigated that issue. You know, no, but is that say. different than what you're saying, right? No, it's well, not about, say, well, he's it's not that assuming there's a random number generator. I want to say that sometimes like these philosophical differences can go a long way to, you know, just kind of inform the kind of discussion that is going on. Because a lot of the things that I've been hearing in this discussion goes back to that. You know, it's like, where is this randomness coming from? Is it the word that is random, or is the randomness like now? I understand what you're saying, but I didn't it's understand. Like, Why do you say that frequentists believe there's a random number generator? I didn't understand they that put part. uncertainty on the data. So right, they, but, assume, but, they assume the data are produced. But just think through this. They, like, they assume the data I, yeah. is generated from distributions. No, but but what what but but what Neiman was doing is he said I'm I'm in the Bayesian world, so there's a prior and there's a and there's a likelihood and there's a posterior, so there's that's Bayesian, but then he's like, but I want a conclusion, that would be the that would be, the same regardless of the choice of the prior. Yeah, that's not about thinking it's problem, a random number. Problem has never been solved. But What's that? Anyways, no, but that, problem but that's that, 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 no, it's not like. No, but that's what the frequentist test is. So it's just I don't. I'm not. I, I'm, I'm beyond like fade. Fade to black. Fade to black. Yeah, I, I guess you're right. You're going in circles. You're going in circles. Yeah, yeah. I am beyond the methodological issue. I was just going to point out that there is still these unresolved problems. Like where do we think this randomness comes? And depending on where we come, we call it noise or we call it what something else. And with the way we're thinking about the brain, I was thinking about what Charlie was saying about like where is the computation? Where is this randomness? Where the, where the randomness kind of contributes to the competition or not, and, and all of that, that really comes down to these ideas, like is there randomness in the physical, is it like the physical reality created through a random process versus, uh, you know, that's more like our limits that we see it that way. That, that's, all, that's all I wanted to bring back to the Yeah, yeah, I totally, like I mean. Just saying, I don't want to, you know, like, there was a really like the source of the randomness is, um, I mean, is, um, I mean, the large majority of the time seems to be the lack of knowledge of the agent who is coming up with the probability. Like said. Yeah, Barlow said that what the what was that quote? So the the uh, neuron, it's not the neurons incompetence, it's the experimental, it's yeah, ignorance. I don't think that's, I just, I'm just saying so that's. Bayesian. <laughs> I'm just saying that's actually different from you could do that you could believe that and do the frequentist stuff that's what Efron's saying in that article yeah um, but this is like so much of this <laughs> is embedded in the language of all of this just that we spent the 15 minutes trying to decipher the sort of vantage point on the word noise when 
I mean, it's yeah. It, there's a, we yeah. ended up probably doing the Jim Bauer, the the um, the Comp Nero thread that you were referring to. <laughs> not that even. That was very controversial. Not even. <laughs> got started. I think I was, <laughs> Francesca's ready to, <laughs> to keep going. But we, we're going to have to call it because it's late and this was fun okay. and uh, illuminating. And there's going to be a lot of Wikipedia searches after this. I'm sure I'll watch the listeners as well as myself. But thank you for joining us and doing this and playing along. And uh, this has been our scientist talk show. I ended up slouching anyway. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Great. Cool. Yeah. I was kind of like, what is going on? Sorry, yeah, that part, that part took a No, 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 it's always fun to watch. I just...